Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Be glad there's one place in the world where everybody knows your name. Everybody knows your name Hey, we got a great uh, Sunday service in store for you. How many new people are here today? Well, welcome, welcome. Yeah. Okay, new people. Two years ago, I sat with that lady in the peaches in the corner, okay, and I said, the first thing they try to sell me, or the first thing they tell me that I'm wrong, or try to shove down my throat I am out that door okay and uh, that is the honest to God truth because I have been seeking all my life and I was like what's this about well let me tell you something this is where it's at this is an oasis of your spirituality hi everyone how's the sound is it good well from my years of teaching karate, I did learn about being present because karate is about defense, not offense. A lot of people say, oh, you're going to beat me up. No, I'm about protection. So one of the things we learn is being present. And this is something that can be really good in your personal toolbox of your spiritual journey, of your own personal growth. Because we'll, we'll go into some details about how you can do that, and there's a handout in the back afterwards. So I want to first start out with, how many people know who Madame Curie is? She was the discoverer of radium, but she was the co-discoverer. Her husband discovered it also. I mean, they would sit there and think, oh my gosh, it glows in the dark, and they'd stare at it for hours. Well, you don't hear about him much because he died at the age of 47 in 1906. So what did he die of? He's a young man, even back then. So we're going to go through a couple scenarios. Well, he did the Geisel experiment. He put the radium on his, on his arm for 10 hours. And after 52 days of doing this, he got this, and that's a picture of his arm, a gray color, coloration in indicating a deeper necrosis. So was it some kind of radiation poisoning? Or was his head run over by a beer wagon while he was you know, crossing the street? Um, was it a hot air balloon accident? That was a big thing back then, is this early flight. And this is, this is you know, before the Wright brothers, so that was a popular way of travel and, and have fun, especially in France. Was it a laboratory explosion? He was a scientist, and uh, there was a huge explosion in Paris, and uh, it was because of a pressurized vessel. So, how many people think it was um, radium? Raise your hand. How many people think it was a laboratory explosion? How many people think it was a balloon accident? Okay. How many think he got his head run over by a beer wagon? <laughs> beer wagon wins! <laughs> he was in a hurry. 
He was distracted by his thoughts. He was not present to the danger. And if anybody knows academics, I was married to one, they are never in the moment. <laughs> Believe me, I could tell you stories about all the academics and the scientists I have dated. <laughs> so, colleagues and his family seemed to instantly understand what happened. His lab assistant, when talking to the police, said he was never careful enough when he was in the street walking or when he was riding his bike. He was always thinking of other things. And this was also an opinion by Curie's own father. When he said, when he heard of his son's death, he said, what was he dreaming of this time? <laughs> Believe me, I know the kind of person they're talking about. He was not aware of his surroundings. He was not being in the present. His senses were not fully engaged. I mean, it was a six-ton beer wagon pulled by a team of horses clattering on cobblestones. How do you not notice that? And I actually went on Google, and I, I looked at the street and the whole area there, and if he wasn't paying attention, he would have, you know, he would have seen it. So this example is an accident of not engaging the senses and not being in the present. Now let's talk about being in the present. Remember when you were a child, summers went on forever. The, the, the dandelions, if you grew up in the Midwest, the, the, the smell of, of, of fresh mown lawn, the, the blue sky, the, the beautiful one, warm air in your lungs. And didn't time seem to move more slowly when we were children? I mean, the summer went on forever. It was just endless. And now it's like, where'd the summer go? I mean, where'd the year go? Yeah. Time compression. It's when we do things, the same thing, over and over, time seems to compress. We have the same breakfast, we have the same lunch, we're, we're, we're driving to work or we're doing... One summer, I was out of work and I spent it playing with the dogs in the yard. I was like a kid again. And that summer went a long time because I was fully engaged. I wasn't doing the same thing. And when you're doing the same thing, None of those things seem to matter. You don't pay attention and time compresses. And it seems like it goes fast because we weren't there. Unfortunately, we are missing out on most of our lives. Most of our living is done in the details that we tend to ignore, the routines that we use to Pay, we pay a little attention to these things, and we're going on automatic. Have you ever had that experience where you're driving home from work, and you get home, it's like, how did I get here? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've done that. You got the radio on, you're thinking about something, or you're mulling over, you know, what happened yesterday, somebody said this, and you're still pissed off about it. We're thinking about the past. One of my pet peeves is when someone says, I'm just killing time. Ooh, I hate that. I always say, I'm filling time. When someone is killing time or just passing the time, events are passing in front of you and you don't see them. You are passing the now. So what is awareness? Awareness is defined as a state or ability to perceive, to feel, or to be conscious of events, objects, or sensory patterns, things that are changing, things, things that, um, that we're noticing in, in reality around us. We are aware. Now there are different types of awareness. There's external awareness and internal awareness. And under external awareness, we have situational awareness, which is one of the things I teach in karate, social awareness, environmental awareness, and work awareness. And internal awareness is self-awareness, intuitive awareness, body awareness, and emotional awareness. Now these aren't mutually exclusive. So A is A. Aristotle said that 2,000 years ago. A thing is itself. It cannot be something at the same point at the same time and be something else at the same time. So our focus is single. We move here, we move here, we move here. Multitasking is basically jumping from thing to thing. It's not having the same two things simultaneously focused. So 
when you're in the zone, you ever experienced that where you're writing or playing music or something and you're creating something and suddenly you look out the window and it's dark? Like, wow, where'd the time go? That is in the zone. That's a total focus on one thing. And daydreaming is kind of a rambling inner focus on the past or the future or some fantasy. And it can jump around or zone into a storyline. Now, I didn't drive till I was 21. And I, my excuse was, um, I prefer horses. Why not ride a buddy to work? But the real reason was I was afraid. I was afraid to drive because I was such a daydreamer, I was afraid I'd cause an accident. Finally, I had to get over that. A Buddhist priest once said, look to the moon, not to the reflection in the pond. That's one of my artworks. <laughs> I actually built that bridge. <laughs> it's a 3D model. Now, let's talk about external awareness. The situational awareness, social awareness, environmental awareness, and work awareness. Now, situational awareness versus head candy. Head candy to me is like daydreaming, thinking about stuff I'd rather be doing. Um, and I was really good at that in, in, in school because I was so bored. My, my, my work papers were like constantly drawings all over it, you know, that you'd hardly see the, the homework because I was just so bored. So situational awareness is a perception of environmental elements with respect to time or space. It's a comprehension of their meaning and the projection of their status or their value after some variable or thing has changed, such as time, a predetermined event, or some other variable. So, so things that you value out in reality can change. You, sometimes you'll think it's more important now, it's broken, it's not very important today. So that's part of it. So head candy, being anywhere but here. And I was really good at that. Daydreaming, reliving the past over and over again, worrying about the future, having conversations in your head, or other inner things that take you away from the present. Our little dolphin's gotta go. <laughs> okay, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so situational awareness. Sometimes you do not choose the moment, it chooses you. We've all had that happen. This moment, right now, is your last opportunity to influence what happens next. If you are not present, if you are not in the now, you become aware of events and options after they occur. Opportunities may be lost. Explore your intuitive emotions, what they may be telling you or warning you about. Have you ever experienced a loud noise like lightning going off and, you know, it jars you? Or were you taken from your distraction by the noise? Perhaps the noise brought you back from distraction, back into the present moment, back from thinking about the past or worrying about the future. Being in our heads so much takes us away from what is actually happening in the now. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't daydream or anything like that. I mean, that's good stuff, too. I like head candy. But sometimes I think we, because we're beings of ability to think like other animals do not have this higher level cognitive power, we tend to go in our head so much instead of being out in reality. So being aware allows the perception of events to occur and the perception brings information to you via your senses as, as, as opposed to your memory. Think current information versus dated information. My grandfather once said to me when I was a teenager, Karen, you talk too much. <laughs> you know what you know. What does the other guy know? You have everything to gain by listening. It took me like 25 years for it to sink in, but... <laughs> so what is re reality trying to show you? 
Think about an event that happened in your life that you can remember like it was just yesterday. It is so vivid in your mind. Like for me, it's September 11th. That second plane going in and me thinking, what? There was a plane already. Or when the space shuttle exploded. Or Kennedy was assassinated. I mean, I think I was in fifth grade. And Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. What do you remember as if it happened, just like it was yesterday, because it was so vibrant? Well, when that event happened, we were taken from our inner distractions and routines, like the sudden noise example. Our mental focus and our senses were fully engaged. We weren't thinking about dinner or Aunt Molly's like inner dilemma or whatever. We were, we were dreaming about our next vacation. We weren't thinking at all. We were experiencing. Now there's work awareness versus inattention blindness. Work awareness is a form of situational awareness that applies to where you work. It is concerned with the perception of the environment critical to decision making in the workplace. Now, there's two different kinds of inattention blindness. They're very similar. One is a failure to notice some it's, uh, unexpected stimulus, like in one field of vision, because you're demanding, other things are demanding your attention. This is a result of a lot of pilot error accidents with airplanes. They're so busy trying to get through the two thunderstorms and they don't realize that the ailerons and the little, little button is flashing saying they've frozen over. Yeah. That is a very common thing. Then there's also cognitive capture or cognitive tunneling. And this is a form of inattention blindness where a person is so focused on the instrumentation or the task at hand like internal thoughts or you're not in the present environment. Think driving and texting. I mean, I rear-ended a guy because I was like on my phone and I was trying to figure out where I was, the bus station was so I could pick my uncle up. So, you know, been there, done that. I don't do it now. <laughs> Now, inattention blindness is exploded, exploited by illusionists. Think of the magic shows. In the performance, the tricks that the guy is performing, and I have been, I went to David Copperfield's show, and I'm not a magic fan. So I thought, oh, what am I gonna do? You know, I'm just dragged to this thing. So I thought, I'm gonna look where he doesn't want me to look and see what happens. I saw 99% of all the tricks. He would have a beautiful girl here. He'd be flashing a, a, some kind of a bandana or whatever colorful thing. And over here, out in the open, is all the tricks. Every single trick I could see what he was doing with everything. And this happens a lot in reality. There's so much we don't notice. Uh, a few years ago, illusionist David Copperfield magically escaped getting robbed at, at an airport by tricking the robbers. Is it appearing? Oh, there it is. Mine's, not, mine's taking a little longer to show up. Now, environmental awareness. It's a form of situational awareness that pertains to the general world around you. It is concerned with perception of the environment critical to human and personal survival. It demands seeing things as they are and not as you wish them to be. A quick example, in, I'm the astronomy club and I was with the club and most people had left and I was there with uh, the president, Larry, and we were, I, was, I was about to leave. And he had all this expensive equipment, and I saw a vehicle parked kind of far away from us. I thought, okay, this is in the middle of nowhere. This guy has no business being here. He started walking towards us. And he goes, oh, that's some pretty expensive equipment. Okay, I knew exactly what was going on. My intuition was telling me this is a danger. This guy is interviewing us for a mugging. And so I told him, that's not very experienced. I says, well, you know, Larry, we better, we better pack up because, you know, I gotta teach karate tomorrow, and I'm really looking forward to beating some people up. <laughs> the guy left really quick. <laughs> I guess we failed the interview. <laughs> so, uh, let me see if I can play this. Yeah. Okay, so count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. I'll get down so you can see better.
The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? How many spotted the gorilla? <laughs> For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? <laughs> Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. So this is something police run into all the time when they're crime has happened. They, okay, ma'am, did you get a description? Oh, yeah, he had blonde hair and he was wearing a hoodie. Another guy, yeah, he was, he was a dark fellow and I think he had dark hair and he was wearing a, a red jacket. So a lot of times we see things or perceive them sometimes differently than other people and it's maybe because we weren't paying attention or so other things conflicted with our vision. I have a, a thing I call premise colored glasses. It's seeing the world through some ideology or filtering and filtering everything that comes towards you that doesn't fit in with that ideology. Um, the art of being present entails an openness to any evidence that might suggest an error in one's thinking and a willingness to correct that error. One of my favorite things is to have some paradigm of mine overturned because then I, I'm not afraid because I see all the possibilities open to me that are new and real where the other one was holding me back. To honestly connect with reality, try being open to what is there, unafraid of what you will find. I don't want to be like a blind man trying to cross an intersection and there's some guy with an agenda telling me where the cars are, even if it's me. Now social awareness versus callousness. Social awareness is a form of external awareness that pertains to people. It is concerned with perception of the emotional state, the body language, listening to what they're saying, and observing what is done. Callousness is the refusal to perceive and observe people objectively and proceeding to act as if one is not perceived and observed them. I had a friend like that, Bill Bucko. <laughs> you remember him. I told him, okay, you're meeting my boyfriend. And he's very depressed because he lost his job. Don't talk about X, Y, Z. And it was like, that does not compute. I like talking about X, Y, and Z. And he proceeded to do just that. Now, social awareness, there's conversational awareness. The awareness of what someone is actually saying. There's the body language, being aware of what, how, they're, how they're moving, like mo what's what I call monitoring your audience. What are their gross movements? What are their micro face expressions? And what is a person's energy state? It, what kind of vibe do they have? Be observant of how a pa person makes you feel in general. So in conversational awareness, paying attention and listening to what someone is saying instead of thinking what you're going to say next and hoping they'll stop talking soon. We learned that in, in the Compassionate Communication course. That was wonderful. Um, and then actually responding to what was said instead of leading off where you were before they started talking <laughs> or not responding, which is really frustrating and makes someone feel unseen. Now a tip, if someone keeps repeating themselves over and over to you, they think that you haven't heard them. That's a clue that to maybe address what they're saying. So don't discount this clue. And getting a good BS sensor, being aware of someone trying to put one over on you, are they pressuring you to buy some, buy it now, buy some deadline? If that makes you feel uncomfortable, be aware of that. And deal with issues in the moment, not six months later when nobody remembers. I used to do this with my ex-husband all the time. He was like, do you remember six months ago when you said X? No. <laughs> <laughs> 
I've, I've gotten a lot better in dealing with in the moment. And that's all part of being present. When someone is talking to you, listen to what they're saying. If they're hurting your feelings, it's like, all right, I'm feeling hurt. I have to address that. Well, excuse me, that really hurt my feelings. What do you mean by that? Instead of six months later when nobody knows. So when you're monitoring your audience, when you're talking to someone, how are they reacting to you? There's gross emotions. Are they bored? Are they fidgeted? They're looking for their purse, you know? Um, or do they lean in eagerly? Are their eyes looking somewhere else, like maybe an escape route? Or are you hurting their feelings? I mean, look at their face. Or are they angry? Are you saying something, you know, maybe, maybe you're hurting them and you don't know it. Maybe there's a context that's been dropped. Now, micro face expressions is one of my fascinations and I've been studying this. Here you'll find the real person. Learn how to read these. Micro expressions come right from the emotional state of a person. They bypass the rational faculty, the mind. They happen so fast, these reactions, that the person reacting cannot stop them. The mind is simply fast and not fast enough. Scientists have found this to be true. And this is where you'll find the truth. I can be at a party and I'll watch people interact and I'll see the real reactions, how people, it's almost like you're reading minds. It's very interesting. You, you read their emotions and they can fast very quickly. Now beware of people who have a frozen face. That person is hiding, either hiding themselves or hiding something from you. And I notice some people like, if they're, if they're uh, lying to you and they have the frozen face, they'll like, <clears throat> and look down and do the, the, the shrug of the shoulders. Something comes out, something happens in the gross movements if they've blocked their micro expressions. Now, people's energy state, or their vibe, this can tell you a lot about them in a second. Notice and explore how the person is making you feel generally. Are you scared of them or excited and eager? Do they make you feel happy or closed and wary? Are they tense? Look at their shoulders. Are they raised or are they relaxed and comfortable? Observe their eyes. Are they averted? Are they looking down, you know? Are they scanning? Um, do they give you an eerie, bad feeling? You've met those kind of people, right? Like they're menacing or they're gonna manipulate you? Um, or are they open and genuine and unguarded? Like the people here. <laughs> or is there a feeling of a wall between you? You've experienced that, where they meet somebody and there's, you just can't get beyond something about them. Or are they trying to dominate you and intimidate you? Or are they being fake, like their smile doesn't match their vibe, like, yeah, I really like that. <laughs> the eyes are not engaged. Now in the animal world, animals are very sensitive to one another's energy. If you ever watch the dog whisper, you'll, you'll understand that. When the lion is not hungry, all of the animals, they hang out together at the water hole, everything is cool, you know. But when the lion starts to get hungry, suddenly the animals are all gone. They notice the different energy the lion is giving out. Animals are always in the present. Well, except my dog. <laughs> in the human world, we are more protected. We have houses, we, we have all this structure around us, police force to protect us. And we become kind of lazy and lax in this habit of awareness that the animals have. So in social una unawareness is callousness. Callousness is a refusal to perceive and observe people objectively and proceeding to act as if one has not perceived and observed them. Like sh being insensitive or cruel, disregard for others. It could be willful or unwillful. Some people simply don't have any skills. Um, they don't care to monitor their audience. Um, I look at manners as a social grease that keeps the society running. It's a form of respect for one another. And just like, I have a friend who says, well, I'm a free spirit, I should be able to do whatever I want. If I want to tell jokes that are off color or whatever, I should be able to do that. And I says, well, no, I don't think you should. He says, well, I won't do them to you then. <laughs> but everybody else gets me because I'm cool. I was like, well, okay, but you just hurt this guy over there and this guy over there. So again, being aware of yourself. I don't think that I have a right to ruin somebody's day. I think of it as, an emotional initiation of force.
So, recap, external awareness is situational awareness, social awareness, environmental awareness, and work awareness. Now what about self-awareness? Intuitive awareness, body awareness, emotional awareness. Self-awareness is the capacity for introspection and the ability to recognize oneself as an individual separate from the environment and under individuals. When we focus our attention on ourselves, we evaluate and compare our current behavior to our internal standards and values, like, did I do that? Was that a right thing for me to do? We become self-conscious as objective evaluators of ourselves. Most people find it hard to be objective about themselves, because, I mean, how do you look at yourself? I once had someone said, this was years ago, I was sharing an office, and he goes, Karen, you know, you're really smart, and I really enjoy talking to you, but sometimes you can be a real jerk. I thought, oh, I respect this person. Why is he? And then I imagined myself coming to myself, and I realized I had a chip on my shoulder from the bullies in high school. I would start philosophical arguments with people just to basically turn them off before they rejected me. And I decided, I'm going to let my sacreds all hang out. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to be like a Christmas tree and just be myself. And if you like it, fine. If you don't, fine. And that's been working pretty good, so. <laughs> now, intuitive awareness. You know, but they say, well, women have intuition. And men, men, it's like, it's a gut feeling. It's the same thing, girls. But let them think that. <laughs> Now, intuition is the ability to understand something immediately without the need for conscious reasoning. The root of the word intuition means to guard and protect, and that's what it does for us. It works much like the creative process. Same thing as, as, as creating something, you take something from here and something from here and you put it together that wasn't put together before. It is our creative process in the emotional way. So Think about this, experience without intuition is like knowledge without wisdom. Experience without your intuition is like knowledge without the ability to use the knowledge. So if intuition is trying to tell you something and you, you ignore it, it's, it's what's what good, what good is it? It's not helping you. So someone who's very experienced has many memories. We all have memory, many memories. The creative process in our subconscious will take environmental data and memory of that data and present it as an emotion or a reaction that can be felt in the body about what feels right or wrong. Like that guy who parked his car way away from us in the dark and he had no business. I immediately, my intuition was saying, okay, there's a situation here and I'm not gonna leave this guy by himself with this expensive equipment. Have you ever had the experience where you knew something before you knew it? That you felt it before your, your conscious mind is like, I got a feeling about something. Well, that's what intuition is. It's knowing without consciously knowing why. It's getting from A to Z without stopping at all the letters in between. But remember that just because you have an intuition, it doesn't mean that your decisions are solely based on that. You have to use your mind, facts, evidence to be able to take it to its logical destination. So don't be afraid to explore these things because they can save your life. Now body awareness is basically, how does my body move? What kind of body do I have? How can I move it? Um, it's a key element like dance or karate or fencing or anything like that to know, like for example, doing this. That's why cops use this. If you can't do this, there's something wrong with you. You're impaired. Now emotional awareness means knowing what you are feeling and why. It's the ability to identify and express what you are feeling from moment to moment and to understand the condition, connection between your feelings and your actions. Emotional awareness also allows you to understand what others are feeling and to empathize with them. Now, total reality immersion. Can we be totally like an animal in reality? And, and, and does our mind get in the way? There is a technique developed by Gavin DeBecker for training elite bodyguards for presidents and rock stars. He has a whole company for this. And I read his book, and this is where I, kind of got, I got this part. We need to transition our busy minds to a totally aware state. And this is gonna take some effort. Your mind will resist this process at first. Mine was a bucking bronco. 
This is a process, a practice, as opposed to a switch that you can just flip. In effect, we must occupy the mind to prevent it from occupying us. Step one, take a walk, but make sure you're alone. Just by yourself, so you don't have any other distractions, nobody talking. Occupy your mind with real events that are in your environment right now. Engage all the senses and emotions. Focus on the current. Perceive things that happen, and then quickly discard them. Like, like you're on a train, you know, and, and you see things are coming past you. But don't grab onto anything. See, hear, touch, smell, emote, then let it go. Releasing it to make space for the next perception. Your body, your, your mind will try to hold on to these things that have already disappeared. Use the advancing reality to keep you in the moment. This moment, then this moment, and this moment. At first, you, to train your mind, you're going to name the object you're encountering. Mailbox, cat, blue flower. This technique is like training wheels for your mind before it can fully immerse into reality. While you are walking and perceiving, do not judge. Do not make up stories about what you see. Do not think. Now, I'm a thinking person, but you didn't, for this experiment, you want to just perceive. Don't think, oh, blue mailbox. You know, it's got some chip paint. I'm going to have to tell a neighbor about that. It's looking pretty bad. No, don't go there. <laughs> if you feel an emotion, feel it. Name it. Like pleasant or happy or joy or anger, then move on. Don't analyze it. Don't judge it. After a while, you will not need to keep naming things. Something wonderful is going to happen. You will have reached total immersion. Step nine, your senses will be totally engaged. You will not need to name every item. You will know it. What is so interesting about this experience is that your mind has already done so much data storage that you really don't need to think about this. You don't have to think about it at all. You know it. You automatically, you see, feel, hear, smell, all the senses are interacting with the sum total of your stored knowledge without getting your busy mind in the way. Your mind will begin to fight you. It will intrude with a song or a judgment or a memory. If this happens, and it will, don't feel bad about this, because, man, <laughs> it was hard for me. Go back to naming things. And this will reframe you back to the present. The song will prevent you from hearing the crickets or other noises. When it has gone back to nature, when, when the song is gone, suddenly you hear nature again. It's amazing. I, I've, I've done this. The more you practice this technique, the better you will become at being fully present. You will eventually be able to turn the switch on more easily, and more of the world will become yours. Children do this naturally, every day. They tend to be more engaged in the moment because every moment is new and exciting. That is why a child's summer is so long, and for an adult it flies by so fast. I'm not advocating not thinking, get me straight, I love thinking. But I do recommend, for your own personal enjoyment, trying this technique and see if it improves the quality of your life. So again, we have external awareness and internal awareness. External is situational awareness, social awareness, environmental awareness, and work awareness. And internal awareness is self-awareness, intuitive awareness, body awareness, and emotional awareness. So slow down this cascade of habitual reactions. See yourself and others more clearly. Listen deeply and understand just things as they are. Be open to creativity beyond whatever we're conditioned to think or believe. Respond in the moment to complex and or emotionally charged situations, not six months later. Achieve balance between the inner and outer awareness. Now the total reality 10-step immersion technique is in a handout at the hospitality desk in the back for you. And I really recommend that you try that. So thank you very much. And here's some books I recommend and, and just some things that were um, resources for myself. So thank you very much. Thank you.